The first step to learning the scripting API is to learn basic JavaScript. So today I'll be going over everything necessary for creating an awesome add-on. The first thing you need to do is learn what a variable is. So think of a box with a label. That label is the variable's name, and everything inside of the box is the variable's data. It could be a sentence, a number, or really anything you want it to be. A string is a variable that contains a sequence of characters. It will always be surrounded by single or double quotes. For example, a sentence or a line of text is a string. A boolean, more commonly referenced as a bool, is a variable that represents truth values, so either true or false. And a number is, well, just a number. When making a new variable, it always has to be declared with var, let, or const. Let is used for variables you want to be able to change, so something like the player's health has to be able to be reduced, meaning you should be declaring the health variable with a let. Const is used for variables that cannot be changed. They must be set to something as soon as they're declared. For example, the amount of inventory slots a player has would be a constant number, so it cannot be changed. Now that you know what a variable is and how to use them, we can move on to a couple really useful aspects of JavaScript. This is an if statement. Everything inside of the parentheses should return a bool, and if that bool is true, then everything inside of the curly brackets will run. When using an if statement, you can also use else if, and this will run a check only if the if statement above it returns false. Then finally, we have the else statement. This one does not have parentheses because it'll run code only if all of the if and if else statements above it were false. Something really important to remember is that since the if and else if statements take a bool, the way to compare other variables like two numbers is by using two equal signs. Using two equal signs basically just says, does this variable equal this other variable? And if it does, then it returns true. Otherwise, one equal sign is used for setting a variable. If you were to use one equal sign in the if statement instead of getting a bool, you'd accidentally be setting the variable's value to something else. A module is a script file that holds variables, functions, and classes that are used in other scripts. With the scripting API, almost everything needed will be from the Minecraft server module. A function is a reusable block of code that performs a specific task. For example, you could have a function that counts to 10, and when you run the function multiple times, it'll count to 10 each time. And last is a class. A class is most often used as a type of data structure. Class will contain a constructor that lets you create a new variable while providing inputs. For example, a player's location is a vector3 class, and the class has variables labeled x, y, and z. Each variable is a number. Inside of a function, you can use for loops that iterate all code inside of them as many times as you want. The for loop will take three expressions to run. Expression 1 is executed one time before the loop starts. Expression 2 is the condition for keeping the loop running, and expression 3 is executed once after each iteration in the loop. Everything inside of the for loop's curly brackets will be executed once on each iteration. In this example, I'm declaring a variable i as the number 0 at the start of the loop, and then on each iteration it checks if i is less than 5, and if it is, then it runs the code in the curly brackets. After that, then it adds 1 to i, and then runs the next iteration. For loops are very useful when you want to do something to all variables inside of an array. Array. And an array is a variable that can hold one or more variables. All variables inside of an array are inside of square brackets. To access a variable inside of an array, you need to know which index it is inside of the array. Zero is always the first item's index. There are also for each loops, which allow you to iterate over each item in an array with a reference to each iteration's item. To use a for each loop, type the array's name and then add dot for each, and then inside of some parentheses, type a name for the array's item, then add this. This is an arrow function. It's pointing to some curly brackets, and inside of this, you can run your code on each item in the array. That's pretty much everything you need to know about JavaScript, so now I'd like to explain Bedrock Scripting API. The main thing to know is that 99% of all scripts will be using events. An event is a trigger that provides data for its relative action. An example would be using an item. There is an event called item use, and it provides the data for the player using the item and the item being used. However, there are two different types of events. There is the after event, and then there is the before event. The after event will run code after the event takes place. Most of the time, you'll be working with these. And lastly, the before event will run code right before the event's action is finished, allowing you to be able to cancel the event. An example could be for breaking a block. In the after event, the block will have already been broken, whereas in the before event, since it's technically before the action is finished, you would be able to cancel it and prevent the block from breaking. The first step when starting your script is to import all of the required modules. For this first example, we'll only need the world class from the server module. The world class contains all of the after and before events 
necessary for almost every script to run. This first example will be a pretty basic script, and then after we will move on to a more complex script. So first, we can use the item use after event to get the information whenever a player uses an item. As you can see in the documentation, the event will give us access to the player and the item stack that triggered the event. So with that information, we can look at the item stack class to see what we can use from it. Right here, it says that we can get the type ID, and that is a string for the identifier. So we can use that to check if the item being used is the item we want to be the trigger. So back to the script, we can check if the item being used is a stick by saying if event.itemStack.typeID, and now we want this code to run only if this if statement is true, but right now, the if statement's check is not returning a bool. To fix that, we can add two equal signs, and then, since itemStack.typeID is a string, we can compare it to another string to see if they are the same. And using the information I taught you about strings, we can just type quotes, and then type the string we want to check for. In this case, we'll just check if the type ID equals a stick. It's also important to note that the type ID also includes the prefix of an item. In creative, you can type slash give at s, and now you can see all of the items with their prefixes. Since we just want to use the stick, we can just type minecraft colon stick. I want to give the player a random item whenever this is true, and there's a few ways to do this. First is probably the easiest way, and all you have to do is create a loot table in your behavior pack. But since this tutorial is about scripting and not a behavior pack, we're going to create the loot table from scratch using scripts. Since we want each item to have a number for the weight, string for the type ID, and a number for the amount of items to give the player, we can use a class to be able to hold all of these types of data in a single variable. Let's make a class called pool. We need to add all of the data here, and then we can make a constructor that assigns all of the variables when we make a new instance of this class. Now we need a loot table class, and this is going to take a number for the amount of roles it's going to do, and an array for all the pools in the table. We can then make a constructor for this as well. Now all we have to do is create a new loot table like this, and then assign all of the data. First, we have the roles, and now we have the array of pools. To make a new pool, we can do the same thing we just did for the loot table, and inside of here you can add as many pools as you want. Now we could technically just get a random item from this array of pools and give it to the player, but right now the weight isn't doing anything. What we want to happen is that for each weight, that would be the amount of that single pool inside of the array. So let's say we have two pools and one has a weight of 9. The weight of 9 means there should be 9 of that pool in the array. So when a random one is chosen, there's a 90% chance of getting that item. That's because in total we would have 10 pools if the weights were applied. So to do this, we can create a function that will return a new loot table class. We can call this function create loot table and we can make it take in a loot table. I know it may seem confusing why we need a loot table to make a loot table, but hopefully by the time we finish this function you'll understand why we're doing this. So inside of the function we can create a new loot table called anything. I'm just going to call mine lt and then we can use the loot table we passed in for the roles. Now we need the array of pools, but we actually want to create this dynamically so we can just use empty square brackets here. Now we can use a for each loop to loop over each pool in the passed in loot tables pool array and I'll just call each variable item. Now we need to make a for loop that starts as 0 and increments by 1 as long as it's less than the item's weight. What this is going to do is loop over each pool in the loot table and make a new variable for each pool called item. We then are running a for loop which will run as many times as the weight value on the item and then all we need to do is push this whole pool into the loot table's array so that the weight represents how many times that pool is in the array. To do this we can call lt.items.push and inside of the parentheses we can just add the item variable since that is a pool. Now at the bottom of this function, everything would have already ran, so we can just return LT. Now we have a working loot table. The only issue is that we aren't using it anywhere. So back to the item use event, inside of the type ID check, we can start using the loot table. First, we need to get a new loot table, so create a new constant variable, I'll just call mine loot table, and set it equal to the function we just created, and make sure to pass in the loot table you made above this. Then, we need to make a for loop that will loop for as many roles there are in the loot table. Inside of the for loop, we need to get a random number for the item's index, and a random number for the amount. So first, we can make a new variable and set it equal to math.random, which returns a random number between 0 and 1. And then we can multiply that with loot table.items.length minus 1, which is just the amount of items in the pool array. But since every array starts at 0, that means the length of items actually has to be reduced by 1, otherwise we would get an index out of range error. This does get us a random number from 0 to the amount of items in the array, but there's one issue with this, and that's that this is a floating point number. If math.random is 0.03, Four, then multiplying that with anything will get us a number with a decimal point, but we want a whole number which is called an integer. So we can actually just say item index is equal to math.round and then pass in item index. And that's actually it for item index. Before we move on, I want to make sure you understand how this is working. So let's say we have 10 pools in the loot table.
table and math.random returns 0.5. Well, if you multiply 0.5 with 10, you get 5. So the fifth item would be given to the player. So now we need to get the amount of items to give the player. And this one's going to look a little bit more complicated, but I promise it's still pretty simple math. Since we want to get a number between the minimum amount and the max amount, we can't just multiply math.random with the max amount, or a value could end up being less than the minimum amount. To fix this, we can create a function called lerp. Lerp is a function that linearly interpolates from one number to the next using a number, which can be thought of as a percentage. 0.5 would be 50%, so that would be in between the two numbers. So the function is going to take three numbers. We can call the first one a, and the second one b, but the third one we're going to call percent, so that we know it has to be between 0 and 1. This is the equation for linear interpolation. So we can just say return a plus parentheses b minus a times percent. Now we can go back to the item use event and use the lerp function. First, create a new variable called amount and set it equal to lerp and pass in item.minamount for a and pass in item.maxamount for b. And then for percent, we can just use math.random since it returns a number between 0 and 1. But this will also return a floating point value, so we need to convert it into an int using math.round. All that's left to do is give the player the item. To make it easier to type, we can make a new variable called item and set it equal to loot tables items with the index of item index and now at the bottom we can just say event.source which if we go to the docs we can see that event.source returns the player class so we can click on a player and see all the stuff we can do for this we just want to run a command so we can scroll down until we see run command and as you can see it just takes a string for the command and it also says it does not take a slash so back to the script we just need to type the command string but an easy way to add data to a string is by using these these are not single quotes and instead it's called a grave accent it is to the left of the number one on your keyboard. When you use this, then you're allowed to add variables inside of a string, but before we do that, we need to type give a s. Now, we can add the item by using a dollar sign and curly brackets. Inside of the curly brackets, we can say item.typeID, since that is the random pool we got. Now we want to add the amount by doing the same thing. Just remember that this is a string for the command, so there has to be a space in between the type ID and the amount, as well as a space between a s and the item's type ID. Now, if we save the code, refresh the project and bridge, and go back to Minecraft, all we have to do is make sure we load a world with the behavior pack applied and experimental options turned on. And now if we right click with a stick, we'll get a random item with a random amount. And if we increase the roles in the script and then save everything, you'll now see that we now get more than one item. That's pretty much it for this example. So now we can move on to a more advanced example. For this example, we will set up a block that connects to itself, kind of like connected textures, but instead it's connected models. You can think of a power cable. To get started, we will need to have a block with all the model parts separated as bones. Block model and texture can be found in the description if you want to follow along without making the model yourself. But for now, we need to make a center of the block. We can set its size to 6 in all axes and then center it by clicking on each direction and lining it up so that there are 3 pixels on each side of the center. Now we just need to make a bone called center and attach the cube so it's a child of the bone. All we need to do now is create a bone for each direction and create cubes that fit in the bounds of the block. So for the top extension, it'll be 5 pixels tall and 6 wide. I'm just going to go ahead and skip ahead to when I have all the extensions finished and then we can move on to the next part. At this point, the model is finished and if you want to set up the UVs and texture the block, you can, but I already have a finished block geometry, so I'll just be using that. So inside a bridge, we can create a new custom geometry block called cable and just use the model and texture we just made. The format version for this block is going to have to be above 1.20, so I'm just going to use 1.20.20. Then under the identifier, we need to declare a few states for each bone. So just like this, we can make a state for the top bone and give it two values, false and true. By putting false first, that makes it so by default the top face will be turned off. Now instead of just using an identifier for the geometry, we actually want to add options for the bone visibility. So just like this, we are going to define the states that control the visibility of the bones. Just make sure to add the identifier back in here as well. After we do that for all the bones, we can set up the queued ticking component so we can run a function in our script every tick. Right here, we are going to be defining an event to trigger and so we can just call it ticking. Now, under the components, we can add the ticking event and make it run a command. This command is what's going to be triggering the script, so make sure you remember what string you put here. I'm just going to call mine connect cables. Now that's actually everything inside of the block, so we can head over to the script. The first thing we want to do is run system.after event, which will allow us to access the script event receive event. Just make sure to add the system from the server module. Now inside of here, we can check if the ID being passed in the event is the connect cables ID, and if it is, then we can run a function. As of right now, we don't actually have a function for connecting cables, so to get started with that, we actually need a data set that we can loop through that gives us the proper faces to enable and disable based on the direction.
direction we are checking. So we can call this checks and set it equal to an array of objects. Each object is going to get three properties. First is the state that we want to enable if this check is true. The second is the face for the other block that we want to enable. And last is going to be the direction that we're checking. And this will be a vector three. So just like this, we can set up all the different directions, making sure that they match the block state names. With that finished, we can make a function called connect cables and make it take in a block. Inside of the function, we want to get all the states from the block. And to do that, we can use states, and this will return a record of all the states in the block. Now we need to check all the direction to see if there's another cable touching this block. We could do this manually, but instead let's use a for each loop. The first thing we want to do in this loop is to check if there's a block in the current checks direction. To do this, we can make a new variable called other block and set it equal to block.dimension.getBlock. Next, we can check if there's a block there by using an if statement and saying other block is equal to undefined. If it is undefined, then we can set the block state in this direction to false. If there is a block, then we can say else if, then in here we can check if the type ID does not match the current block's type ID. If it doesn't, then we can also set the block state to false. Now we can say else, and inside of here, the code will only run if the check block is the same type ID as the original block. And that means that this is also another cable. So we can set both the check block and the original block states to true. Finally, we can apply the new states by saying other block dot set permutation and then using block permutation dot resolve and then we can pass in the type ID for the block and the states. In here, we just want to set the other block states. But now we need to apply the original block states after all of these checks. So outside of the for each loop, we can do the same thing we just did here, but for the original block. Now that's actually it. So if we save the script, refresh the project and bridge, and then test the code, we can see that the blocks now connect to each other like cables. That's actually going to be it for this tutorial. I understand that this tutorial may be a little bit more confusing, but I promise that the more you practice, the more you will understand. When I first started coding, it was very overwhelming trying to learn because I was constantly trying to make something I really wanted to make. But that's not usually the best thing for learning. I think what helps the most is starting out with a small project and following the documentation until you get it working. The biggest issue with watching tutorials is that you're learning how to code the final product. You're not learning how to get to the final product by yourself. I strongly suggest to read the documentation first, and then if you seriously can't understand it or can't find something, then you can go to a tutorial. But treat tutorials as the last resort and treat documentation as your friend. Anyways, if you like this video, then consider liking and subscribing as it really does help out a lot. If you have any questions or ideas for future tutorials or just things you think I can improve on, then feel free to comment or join my Discord as I'm always willing to help out. That's everything for from me and I hope to see you guys in the next one.